<laughs> I didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Uh, hello everyone, welcome. <clears throat> if you're coming for the session on sex work, we're starting now. Hello. So, nice to meet you all. It feels a bit like a high school, you know, like some kind of play or something with the lights and everything. So, nice to meet you. My name is uh, Lucas Stevenson. I'm a director of programs at the European Sex Worker Rights Alliance. We are a European network of uh, around 100 organizations in 35 countries that work to uh, protect the rights of sex workers. And I will be chairing the, the panel today. Uh, we have a session with uh, really amazing uh, speakers, uh, sex worker rights activists and uh, researchers as well who will join us online. I will present them briefly. I just wanted to set up the scene a bit before, before we get into it. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much to Edri for having us here. Uh, it's really exciting. It's the first time, I think, that we have a whole panel on sex work uh, at Privacy Camp, and it's a very important issue for us, and hopefully for you as well. <clears throat> so, uh, ESWA, as I was mentioning, is a sex worker-led network. We have uh, various priorities, including access to health, access to justice, racial justice, labor rights, decriminalization of sex work, and more recently, we started to focus as well on digital rights. So we know that the digital rights of sex workers are critical issues, which, is, which are often uh, overlooked by policymakers and sometimes by other activists as well. And so when we try to put this panel together, we discuss of a title. I know when you try to put a, a session together, the title is the worst part, and you just leave it to the last minute and you can't find it, and it's two minutes before the deadline, and you're like, okay, let's find something very clever. And so we were like, oh, in the eye of the storm, critical crisis, mythical crisis, and then later we realized the eye of the storm is usually the most quiet space of the storm. So our metaphor is a little bit limited, but actually if you look at us and how calm we are, maybe it does make sense. So what we meant by the title is that, you know, if you look at uh, decades and decades of like policies and laws affecting prostitution or sex work as we prefer to use it, the issue is that sex work has always been conflated with another issue which we call trafficking in human beings. And so I want to just, before I give the, the, the panel, uh, panelist uh, mic, I want to take you back to uh, 100 years ago in 1910, uh, where actually the League of Nations came up with the first international, one of the first international treaty. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the first international treaty was actually uh, developed by the United Nations, so the League of Nations at the time, to tackle what was the biggest issue at the time, which was, I don't know if you know, maybe somebody know. What was the first treaty? White slavery. So the issue was that it was so critical to address the issue of white slavery that we had to have all these nations come together and create internationally binding treaties in order to address this problem. And by white slavery, what was actually meant was prostitution. And so when we look at the issue of trafficking and the way it's been framed internationally, it's always been an issue about uh, you know, controlling prostitution and controlling migration in particular, and it has from the beginning extremely racist uh, undertone, if not completely overtly racist overtone. So if you look at in the US in particular, like Man Act, 
was also a law that was developed in 1910, the same year, in order to address prostitution. But this law was mostly used against black men uh, to arrest them in order to, like, under the guise of like protecting white women from prostitution. So from the very beginning of the development of laws on trafficking, sex workers, sex work and trafficking has been conflated. And 100 years later, 2022, what we see now, whether it's at the Council of Europe, the UN level, the European Parliament, this conflation of prostitution and trafficking continue to be affecting sex workers. And this is what we're going to talk about today, as well as other issues affecting sex workers. Um, I think that's all I had to say as a, as a setup. Uh, so the three panelists uh, today, we first have uh, the amazing uh, Kali Sudra. Uh, which is a who is a sex worker, a sex worker right activist. She's also one of the board members of ESWA. And she will, be, she will be speaking about her own personal experience, but also as well about FOSTA SESTA, which she will explain in, in more details. And we then have the Eve, as amazing, Eid Aydinalp, who is our uh, program officer on digital rights. And it will uh, discuss a bit the, the work we are doing at ESWA on digital rights, some of the key issues and some of the successes that we, we had. And our final speaker, who will be on the, the, the screen, is Dr. Elisa Redmire uh, from the Max Planck Institute of Software System. And I got the name right for once in my life. Uh, Elisa is a fantastic researcher. We've been collaborating on the research together. I really recommend uh, reading some of the research Elisa has been developed with uh, different partners. Very, very interesting on uh, digital rights of sex workers. So I now give the mic to our first speaker, Kali. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Hey, everybody. Thanks for, for having me here today. Um, so, as Luca said, I'm a full-service sex worker, so uh, the things that I've written today um, are from my own first-hand experience and also the experiences of other um, colleagues in the field. Um, so, I'd specifically... Sorry, I'm going to read because I get really nervous. <laughs> so, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read some of the stuff and I will also look up and, and smile at your lovely faces. Um, I would specifically like to address like, how digital technologies um, are critical for sex workers and how our access to these technologies is prevented and how this impacts our health and our safety well-being. To explain this, I'm going to use the COVID crisis and how sex workers experience this health crisis as an example. And lastly, I'm going to talk about certain situations and the crisis rhetoric can be used to attack sex workers' rights as we've been experiencing years for years now. And, and if we look at how human trafficking is used as an excuse to criminalize sex workers and to cut their access to critical digital tools. So as many of you know, the COVID crisis uh, certainly pushed um, many companies to accelerate to be digitalized. And it made us realize that um, it is crucial to have access to digital technologies in this time. I don't think anybody really could have predicted what was going to happen. But one thing that became clear with the COVID crisis is that the general population and sex workers both had a great need for digital technologies. Um, it pushed sex workers to limits where we had to look for new ways of working because um, it was especially noted where there was harsh lockdowns, where um, they shut down brothels and clubs, um, saunas, massage parlors, et cetera, et cetera. So we couldn't leave our houses and we had to go somewhere else. Um, many sex workers found I mean, it also, does this work? Yeah, it does. <laughs> Sorry. Many of us found that, um, that we had to find another way to find income. So a lot of us turned online. So um, big platforms like uh, ManyVids and OnlyFans received a big influx of, of new people trying to find work as well, not just sex workers. A lot of people that had lost their jobs during the pandemic also were able to rely on sex work uh, to help uh, pay bills because we weren't... Um, it was a kind of unprecedented times. We didn't know what to do. Um, and thanks, uh, so thanks to digital technology, sex workers had access to tools and were able to, you know, sell erotic content or do shows or chat with their clients. Um, and it was such a lifeline for most of us. So um, after, I mean, not after, still during COVID, we realized a lot of our work could be digitalized and a lot of sex workers are now being drawn even more to digital technologies than before. Um, there are some pros to digitally mediated sex work. Um, the first and foremost being less encounters with the police. Um, as you probably know, sex workers have reported direct violence at the abuse at the hands of police officers, harassment, intimidation, humiliation, extortion, um, just general physical and sexual violence. And um, 
further criminalization also of their jobs, arrests or accusations for other offenses. So having um, kind of like a layer, the internet between us and the police, I mean, they're still there obviously, criminalizing us, but we didn't have to see them in person was um, helped lower levels of violence. Um, also another pro about working online is it was efficient and helped us save time. Um, sex workers could work from our home, a place that we knew, a safer environment, one that was familiar to us. Um, it also helped us have safer sex by only having digital contact with clients. Um, helped us connect online with other communities of sex workers. Um, have conversations about important safety concerns, such as warning other sex workers about potentially dangerous johns or time wasters. Sorry, time wasters, time wasters are the worst. Um, <laughs> Any other sex worker will agree with me. Um, it gave us a space to screen for clients. If you don't know what screening is, it's basically you know just asking clients a few questions so you can have kind of like a digital trail, um, maybe their ID, have their phone number or their address or whatever. Um, this is kind of hard to do in person while doing street-based sex work. It's not impossible, but it's harder to do. Um, also online, it gave us a place where we can advertise our services and just put our policies, which saves us time instead of like having to tell everybody you know, it's just there on the internet. Um, and then working online gives us the possibility to increase income and then also allows us to have community with other sex workers. So having spaces to connect. And then the problems with digital, um, digital sex work, in my own personal experience, I'm just gonna mention two short ones. Financial discrimination, uh, we must rely on financial services uh, to get paid for our work. Um, so it, to do that, we must abide by the T, uh, TOS, the Terms of Service, that are always almost sex worker discriminatory. So it presents a problem if we can't use our, also it presents a problem by giving our uh, really private information out. We have to like, you know, um, use our real names to open up accounts um, and it kind of puts us in a, in a, in a, a very difficult position. Um, big pay, uh, pay platforms like PayPal, for example, are super discriminatory against sex workers. And um, I'll go a little bit more into detail after. And then online censorship, my favorite. <laughs> I, 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 for those of you who know that I have been censored on all, every single platform, even Tinder. So <laughs> they censor me there too. Um, no, but they censor me everywhere. So like, um, uh, but censorship was a is a really big barrier to sex work, and it's also kind of a, a confusing, a confusing barrier because of the algorithms that I I personally don't understand how they work. I just know that they're very uh, racist, and that they go after marginalized identities, for our own good, according to big platforms like TikTok and Facebook, that openly admitted to censoring BIPOC, not too long ago. Uh, the main problem about being censored, uh, it seems like a silly. I mean. Lots of people, when I've complained about censored, being censored, people thought of like kind of gaslit me. It's like that's not that big of a deal. It is because if you, if I don't if I'm not able to advertise for my service online, my work, I can't get I can't get a job. I can't pay the bills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It also pushes sex workers to to the very limits and the margins. And so if you can't get work online, where do you go? You go to the street, which is um, where lots of sex workers face uh, the, the most amount of violence is on the street. Um, the mo so. It is a big deal, you know, it's not, it's not just like some silly thing like, you know, ah, they deleted a post that I made about whatever. <laughs> it's a really big deal, you know. Uh, some of the recent years, there's been heavier restrictions online and we might ask, why is sex work so censored on the internet? Um, it's a highly complicated question with complicated answers, but we could start to describe the why by explaining two bills that were passed in 2018. Sounds like a long time ago, but they're still having an effect in the United States and they had an impact on sex workers and internet censorship in general worldwide. So uh, you probably have heard of SESTA and FOSTA. Um, they sound good in, in, in principle, but they're not that great. Um, there's a Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, which is SESTA, and the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, which is FOSTA. They are package bills that were passed in April of 2018 um, that made it illegal to publish sex online. They were designed initially to censor online content in order to, to curb sex trafficking. They are meant to amend the Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, something that makes online services immune from liability of their users. Um, and it would make Section 230 not apply in cases of sex trafficking. 
So before SESTA and FOSTA, I'm sure maybe you know this, but I'm going to tell you anyways. Um, websites and internet service providers were not held liable for their user-generated content posted on their platforms, including advertisement, comments, forums, et cetera, et cetera. Without this clause exempting websites from liability of their actions, of their users, most websites couldn't afford to exist. They would just have to perpetually ward off potential legal actions based on inflammatory comments or unpredictable behavior of their users. Um, by devoting uh, endless resources to moderating everything their users did by, or um, by simply banning users' activity altogether by throwing millions of dollars at lit litigation costs. So now the owner of any platform um, that posts content involving sexual activity, including consensual sex work, can be sentenced up to 25 years in prison. So FOSTA and SESTA amends this to section, the Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act and um, to allow prosecutors to pe penalize internet companies that promote or facilitate prostitution. So as a result of SESTA and FOSTA, major pages were shut down. One of the biggest ones that was shut down was uh, one that was called Backpage. It was a website basically where you could advertise for your services and get contacted by clients. Um, it didn't just help us meet resource needs, but also helped us stay safer, accessing community, being able to organize those things that I said before about the pros of doing online sex work. So Backpage was a vital tool for sex workers and shutting it down could be compared to that of a massive layoff affecting providers all around the world. Um, it didn't just affect people in the United States. Taking away those tools obviously affected the most marginalized communities like the BIPOC community and the 2S LGBTQI community um, who are more likely to face unemployment and housing discrimination and more likely to rely on sex work to survive. Um, one sex worker responded, Mr. Smatis, she said, it's true that any system can be abused, but the idea that removing sites that are, is going to make someone who is going to sexually abuse someone say, never mind, is ridiculous. It's a child's view of the world. These bills have done so much damage uh, to sex work because they've basically conflated sex work and trafficking, which are two separate things. It pushes us all into one corner, and the more that we use terms like teen prostitute instead of using the word trafficked teen, the less we're actually solving the problem that we claim to be you know, concerned about. Um, okay, so how am I doing for time? I'm, I'm running out of time now. Um, because SESTA and FOSTA created this kind of fake crisis conflating sex work um, with trafficking or child trafficking, many websites were sent into a full-blown panic and didn't want to be conflated either or ca caught up in any you know, legal stuff. So their response was, uh, well, we're going to kick sex workers out or anything related to sex. So there was an outcry of anti-sex worker groups. Celebrities even jumped on the, on the bandwagon like Amy Schumer. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I won't, I won't get into her comment. It was ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and they were like, you know, this outcry about like, you know, what about the children? And, you know, um, if without these bills, uh, child trafficking is going to run rampant, you know. Um, there's a lot of actions that took place to make sure that sex workers were deplatformed, but really little action to deal, like to actually, you know, deal with the problem that they were uh, um, supposedly, you know, um, concerned about. To date, actually, this is really important. To date, it's resulted in just one federal prosecution, according to the new report from the Government Accountability Offices, or the GAO. So basically, there's been no, like, it's not been useful at all. And actually, a lot of people that were pushing for this bill, like, to be passed, um, they they gaslit sex workers, saying this is this isn't gonna with, this isn't meant to harm you, but they knew that it was gonna harm us, even though we said we said it. And um, they haven't really even been public about this one prosecution because I think that they they knew that this bill was just really going after sex work and not after trafficking. Because um, yeah, there hasn't been any kind of like you know any update about how SESTA and FOSTA is working, et cetera, et cetera, because it's not working. Um, another thing is payment processors have become really strict with anything that can be strewed, construed as sex work and social media giants obviously decided to crack down on any material that can be interpreted at all could get you deleted, even, you know, a sexual emoji. Because <laughs> they really, Instagram or Meta said like even emojis in sexual nature. And I'm like, what, which emoji is going to be like sexual, I, you know what I mean? It was like anything could be a sexual nature, like some emoji smiling, I have no idea. The emoji that is a face, you know, like, I have no idea, you know, but anyways, that could get you deleted. So as I mentioned before, the digital sex work really was shaped from the passing of these bills. And um, what if SESTA and FOSTA have in common? Um, firstly, they put sex workers in danger. Secondly, they threaten the whole population in terms of privacy violations and encryption. As we heard in the, um, the chat before, um, 
Uh, and then they made it also complicated for anyone who marginal identity to have a platform. Basically, you know, these bills destroy, destroy our right to privacy, freedom, digital rights. Um, they want to destroy all in forms of encryption. And so nobody gets it unscathed. It's not just a sex worker issue. It's an everybody issue, you know? Um, okay, sorry. How am I going? Two minutes? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't like this at all. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So not far behind Sesame Fosta, OnlyFans followed suit to try to get rid of sex workers. If you don't know, OnlyFans is a platform that provides content for a subscription service, usually mainly used by sex workers, but also other people can exist on there. If you, you're a chef and you want to sell your recipe, is great. Good for, good for you. Um, no one's going to pay for that. But... <laughs> Only fans could come sue me now. Before the pandemic, um, this site generated lots of income, but obviously during the pandemic, everyone's at home with, you know, some disposable income and lots of time on their hands. People bought porn. Great. That's amazing. Sex workers um, helped build OnlyFans, essentially. OnlyFans would not be where it is today without sex workers having, like, you know, broke their backs to, for them to be where they are. And it was a critical tool for us, you know. And then OnlyFans was triumphing, booming in sales. Everything seemed really great. Meanwhile, there was lurking this uh, crisis that I, we didn't know, sex workers didn't know. They came with an announcement this past August uh, 19th that they would ban uh, sexually, no, not this past one, the year before. Um, that they would ban sexually explicit content on their main platform. Super shocking because, like, again, like I said, like, who, like, what were they thinking, you know? Like, who are they, who is going to keep paying for, I mean, everybody that goes to OnlyFans is looking for um, specific sexual content and not, like, you know, recipes from s some weird chef, you know? Um, <laughs> so, anyways, basically, they, they kicked, uh, they were going to, they threatened to kick sex workers off their platform. Sex workers were outraged. Um, Ezwa was outraged, um, and then like a few days later, they completely backtracked their statement. We're like, oh, we didn't mean it. Uh, we would never kick sex workers off our platform. They realized it was a big mistake. Obviously, they were going to lose billions, uh, billions of euros, and um, it wasn't. They weren't really clear. They're kind of shady. They they said it was bank banks basically. Um, that was the reason why that they couldn't process the payments, which was later than they just magically found another bank to work with. They didn't publicly comment on who they were working with. But yeah, basically this essentially, um, this disaster is a very real uh, crisis for sex workers and can be tied back to Sesta and Fosta. Um, a lot of companies, uh, adult companies were feeling the pressure. MasterCard also put on tighter regulations in 2021 around any content that's sexual. Um, so anyways, uh, yes, only fans. Okay, I'm going to read Ezwa's statement and then I'm going to stop. <laughs> So Ezwa also published a statement after OnlyFans decided to try to ban us. Um, Ezwa strongly condemns OnlyFans' initial decision on imposing a ban on explicit content on the platform. This disturbing and unfair decision caused high levels of stress and uncertainty in the sex worker community. Although the suspension of explicit content ban can be considered a step in the right direction, there is an urgent need to address the underlying reasons of exclusion of sex workers from digital platforms and financial services. Among other things, ESWA demands that digital platforms revoke anti-sex work policies and make changes, uh, make public apologies to sex worker communities. Um, OnlyFans kind of made a half assed apology. They didn't really, really care that we were really stressed out. And so despite having to deal with a fake crisis, the conflation of sex work and trafficking, amongst the real crisis, COVID, sex workers wouldn't receive any money from the government, um, we didn't disappear after these bills. Instead, we've globally mobilized sex workers in massive numbers. We've created new community-based organizations based on our needs and have done lots of research. And during the COVID crisis, we received little or no help from the government. We created mutual aid projects across the globe. We've come together in precedent situation to support each other and make sure that we don't get left behind. So to summarize, sex, work, sex workers greatly rely on digital tools to have safer working conditions. And the removal of sex workers from these platforms um, and tools only puts us at greater risk of harm and precarity. We need to be listened to when we're talking about grave laws being passed about our work because bills like Sesta and Fosta had years of damage in our community and continue to harm us. They could have been prevented if sex workers were centered in these conversations. So going forward, we need to make greater efforts to make spaces for sex workers' voices and lived experiences of discrimination. Uh, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, Oh, what? 
Oh, no, it's okay. And you will realize that Kelly is one of these rare sex workers. When you book for 15 minutes, you get 25 minutes. So that's really like, you know, <laughs> why we love Kelly's professionalism and dedication to the cause. Let's see if uh, it is the same. So now, uh, it, uh, who is our program officer at ESWA. Thank you, Kelly. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kelly, for this. <laughs> A fun presentation. So my name is Yit and I am the program officer at ESVA, uh, responsible for our digital rights program. And uh, this is the first time ESVA participating at uh, Privacy Camp, so I'm very excited. Thank you so much, Edri, for organizing this amazing event and inviting us. And um, I must say, I thought it was very fitting uh, for Edri to set this year's uh, you know, team as the constant state of crisis and also point out that the digital is critical, um, especially from sex workers' point of view, you know, because we feel like this constant state of crisis is the usual way of uh, living and just the normal state of the world if you're a sex worker. Um, the infrastructures and tools that are critical to sex workers are constantly being attacked by actors who do not only use legitimate crises as opportunities to push their agenda of excluding and criminalizing sex workers, but also construct, construct crises for the same purpose, as Kadi mentioned. And sex workers always had a very closely knitted, very intimate relationship with technology. I mean, you know, throughout the history, sex workers were one of the early adopters of uh, new communication technologies in order to, you know, um, communicate with their clients and advertise their services. So sex workers used both print media and, you know, audiovisual media very fairly early on, which these sex workers then became uh, one of the first adopters of Internet. So in a sense, they helped develop the you know first versions of internet as we know it uh, but the, you know um, so there has been many benefits of digital tools for sex workers uh, and today they are definitely like an un inseparable part of how sex work is conducted in europe and globally actually uh, however simultaneously sex workers are being stripped away of these very important tools Kali already mentioned uh, her experiences as a worker and how platforms like OnlyFans, for example, are critical for sex work and how cri this critical tool is being taken away from sex workers by companies who constantly undermine sex workers' rights and exclude them from their services, even during actual state of crisis such as COVID. Of course, private actors often you know, base their actions uh, that undermine sex workers' rights on the existing legal frameworks. Uh, and these legal frameworks or the lack of appropriate legal protection for sex workers are the enablers of companies and platforms discriminatory and harmful policies. So as mentioned, for example, Foster Sesta is a good example of how the rhetoric on the human trafficking crisis is utilized and hijacked by anti-trafficking organizations um, in collaboration with right-wing evangelists in the US to deplatform sex workers leaving sex workers no space to breathe, uh, no room for self-expression, and no possibility to generate income. And um, so all Foster Sister did was to put sex workers' livelihoods, health, and safety in danger. And the conflation of trafficking and sex work is detrimental to fundamental human rights of sex workers. And we have seen this repeatedly happening over the years. For example, some politicians keep referring to sex work advertising platforms where sex workers put their ad and contact with their clients. So it's the online workspace of sex workers. We see again and again politicians referring to these websites, these essentially important websites, as trafficking websites. So this is, of course, uh, you know, uh, purposeful framing of these play workplaces as something that they are not. Instead of acknowledging the importance of uh, an actual purpose of these uh, platforms, they are framed as trafficking websites to manipulate public opinion, to get these platforms to shut down. So it's an ideological war on sex work and pornography that unites certain branches of feminist movement and uh, right-wing extremists, which is mind-blowing. <laughs> Uh, we believe that abusive working conditions uh, can happen in any sector. Work can be degrading and workers may find themselves in exploitative working conditions uh, no matter what they do. So the difference here is that workers normally have rights that they can pursue, right? Because sex work is not 
recognized as work and is heavily criminalized, when this abuse happen, happens in sex industry, sex workers have nowhere to go. So the, for us, the real way to fight the exploitation in the sex industry is therefore to grant rights to sex workers, like New Zealand does. And very recently, Belgium took a step towards the criminalization of sex work, which we upload. Of course, sex workers' rights are also attacked by those with no apparent agenda of criminalizing sex work. Uh, and in these cases, the harm mostly arises from actors who might have good intentions. However, due to lack of engagement with sex workers and other marginalized populations, sex workers end up being collateral damage in the policymaking process. So a fairly recent example of this was the Digital Services Act, uh, where the European Greens proposed an amendment with the support of victims' rights organizations working on the issue of uh, image-based sexual abuse, so non-consensual non sharing of images. And Amendment 24B, that's what it was called, uh, if accepted, would have made it mandatory for platforms that host user-generated pornographic content to verify users by collecting their phone numbers and verified email addresses so that police could track down the potential perpetrator based on the data they provided. So image-based abuse is certainly an important issue to tackle and it is part of a wider structural problem, which is violence against women. And it is also a fact that many sex workers are victims of image-based abuse. It can be you know, clients downloading uh, and distributing our images or using them to blackmail sex workers and for extortion. It can be other platforms and websites that collect and curate everything content, stealing you know, sex workers' pictures from their own website to put their own website to drive traffic, basically. So it's a problem that is highly relevant to sex workers, but we fought against this amendment for several reasons. First of all, we advocate for data minimization, especially when working with uh, marginalized communities. Increased data collection and processing is a threat to privacy, and as well as community research on privacy, as well as other many research, shows that protecting privacy and data is crucial to ensure the safety of sex workers. Privacy acts as a pro protective barrier, and um, when privacy is lost, sex workers uh, report that they experience harassment, blackmailing, uh, lose their accommodation and face of uh, face th uh, uh, threat of deportation. Secondly, there was no reason to believe such additional data collection measures would prevent image-based abuse. The fact is that the vast majority of porn platforms are already collecting horrifying amounts of sensitive data. Like Kelly said, you know, when sex workers are registered on these platforms, they have to send their passport copies, they have to send their ID copies, they have to send their selfies in order to you know, show the platform, look, it's me, and they have to sign uh, consent forms with their real names. So all these horrifying amounts of bait sensitive data is collected and stored by the platforms. So it wasn't clear for us how collecting even more data of uh, sex workers would actually, you know, uh, stop image-based abuse if collecting the passport copies didn't stop the uh, image-based abuse. Finally, as I explained, sex workers are one of the populations to experience image-based abuse, and it is their online workplace this amendment directly aimed to regulate. So in this case, it was clear for us that uh, sex workers should have been consulted as priority stakeholder, but that wasn't the case. Uh, we also argued that the non-consensual sharing of images occurs on every platform online, and it is not limited to porn platforms. So this amendment ended up being discriminatory against sex workers. Uh, at that time, we were saying, following their logic, it would make sense. M it would make more sense to ask every internet user to disclose their sensitive data on every platform. Um, but unfortunately, you know, of course, we didn't want this. But uh, now there are concerning policy uh, proposals at EU level that threaten the privacy of everyone and not just sex workers, which is, you know, one of them is child sexual abuse uh, regulation. So, as I'm sure many of you heard of this proposal. Uh, even if you are not directly working on it. European Commission proposed, uh, prepared a proposal that uh, would, will allow service providers to scan private conversations uh, in order to uh, supposedly detect child sexual abuse material and prevent the further distribution of this material. And through this regulation, once again, we see the trend of pitting fundamental human rights uh, such as right to privacy against you know, important issues like the protection of minors continues. In addition, we again see the over-reliance and trust, over-trust in technological solutions to tackle uh, you know, structural societal problems. 
a sex worker rights network that work on uh, topics like privacy and data protection of marginalized communities, we are extremely worried about this uh, regulation because it is not currently in line with fundamental human rights. And the use of automated systems to detect such content, uh, we believe it's going to create lots of false positive results, which will uh, increase the chances of sex workers becoming in contact with police officers, which are the, one of the you know, perpetrators of violence against sex workers. And it is also very damaging uh, to the human psyche to feel like every move you take is surveilled by private corporations and governments alike, even if the part of your identity or the work you do is not criminalized like sex workers. Uh, what this regulation tells us is that it's very bleak, I think, um, that you know, we are not able to find ways to tackle these issues and manage crisis without treating some portion of the population as collateral damage. Uh, so CSAM regulation is nothing less than mass surveillance practice for us, uh, which doesn't even do much in terms of uh, protecting children. And we find it, find it very disproportionate. And there is no legal basis for imposing this level of surveillance on everyone without reasonable suspicion. Um, finally, I'm going to just mention one national level development that is very concerning and use, that uses this crisis uh, rhetoric that politicians love to use, which is online safety bill in the UK. Uh, so this so-called online safety bill in the UK is a prime example of how legitimate intention of protecting children from online harm is again utilized to increase online surveillance to further push online service providers to discriminate against sex workers. So it is very similar to the FOSTA SESTA actually, and the effect impact it will have will be again very similar to FOSTA SESTA. So it essentially makes sex work content, it defines sex work content as harmful content. And there is a line in the bill saying that controlling prostitution for gain is a criminal activity. But controlling prostitution for gain is interpreted very widely in the criminal courts. Our member organization uh, in the UK, the English Collective of Prostitutes, reports that some women have been prosecuted under this offense just for helping a friend, for example, build a website or place an advert online. So companies who aim to avoid any potential liability will make the move to deplatform not only sex work content and sex workers' you know, accounts, but possibly all uh, erotic and sexual content. So the result will be as devastating as Fossa Sesta. So the recap and finalize, I just want to make three points. First of all is, uh, so there are legitimate crises that we are facing today, and it is crucial uh, to have a you know, robust policy landscape that seeks to address these very important issues. However, we should be aware that when there's crisis, uh, there are always people who use those crises uh, to exploit our feelings, to push their own agenda. Uh, we should therefore have a very critical mind when we are facing politicians and other actors who use overly emotional and alarming language to push for their agenda, such as you know, increasing surveillance, for example. Uh, my second point is that uh, tackling techno-solutionism is very important for us. Uh, we are aware that technology has a very important space when we are trying to come up, come up with you know, solutions to our problems. However, techno-solutionism we see today is, uh, especially in the policy making, is like, okay, we you know, build this fancy algorithm or you know, we collect lots of more data and then everything will be fine. We don't have to do anything else. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work. We are therefore advocating for structural solutions that address the root cause of societal problems. So technology won't have a meaningful impact unless we try to tackle racism, poverty, talk about borders and lack of education. For sex workers, for example, the starting point is the decriminalization of sex work, uh, which would grant labor rights to sex workers and help effectively fight human trafficking, violence and exploitation in the sex industry. Finally, ethical, inclusive, and fact-based policymaking is needed more than ever. Uh, today, there is a lack of ethical policymaking at both national and uh, EU level, where policies are being drafted, amendments are put forward, like DSA, uh, without doing the exercise of mapping, mapping out stakeholders and to then initiating conversations with these stakeholders. Only by being truly inclusive, we can lay out effective laws. Um, it is also equally important that the different stakeholders in an issue 
uh, talk to one another and actively seek ways to collaborate. To this end, ESVA has initiated a process that aims to tackle image-based abuse issues collaboratively with other stakeholders, uh, for example. And as the first step of this process, we partnered up with uh, Max Planck Institute uh, in a research project that uh, Elisa will discuss, I think, next. Uh, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Eid. Uh, we can talk a bit more after as well about some of the program we are doing. I'll mention as well this multi-stakeholder dialogue we will be uh, developing with Edri as well, and Elisa will be part of. And I now give the floor to Elisa. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Um, thank you. I will end up echoing uh, in some ways a number of the things uh, that have been said before me. Um, so. As Luca had introduced, I'm a faculty member at the Max Planck Institute, and I run a research group where we have been uh, working with sex working communities and looking at the role of digital technology in sex work for the past um, five years. Uh, and I come out of the field of computer security, and so what brought me to this work was feeling like the tools that we were building as technologists and the research we were doing as computer scientists, particularly in security, uh, was not necessarily addressing the needs of uh, sex working communities and other marginalized communities uh, for a number of reasons uh, that have already been raised on this panel. Uh, so a lot of our work has involved doing um, hundreds of paid interviews uh, with different types of sex workers all around the world uh, to understand uh, sex workers' safety goals, the risks they're facing, their strategies for coping with those risks. Um, and the goal of our work is really to try to understand how uh, technology can start stop hurting uh, and start helping um, people achieve their, their labor goals. Um, and so some of our, our initial work uh, started out with in-person workers in Germany, Switzerland, and the UK, um, and then has progressed to look at uh, folks who are doing either in-person or digital-only work uh, in the US um, and in other regions around the world. Um, in addition to looking at kind of folks' labor practices and the role of technology and safety technology, and in that, we have also done a bit of work on uh, understanding kind of the, the harms and measuring the efficacy of some of the anti-trafficking solutions that are out there. Um, so to offer one example, in the United States in particular, uh, as well as in other regions, um, there was sort of this idea that, oh, if we, you know, do these unsolicited text messages, uh, so if we scrape sex worker advertisements, we put that data in a database, and then we text people, and by we, I don't mean us, but we being some, some organization, uh, we text people and we ask, hey, are you being trafficked? Um, that maybe this would be a, a good way of stopping trafficking. Um, and as might be uh, intuitive, this is not a good way to stop trafficking. And the organizations that do this themselves say that they get less than a 5% response rate to these texts. Um, and also, of course, this scraping is a privacy violation and it can be quite dangerous for folks, right? So folks are not always uh, sole owners of their phones and the person they share a device with may or may not know that they're doing um, sex work. And so getting one of these texts links that information. Um, the texts are often also very uh, stigmatizing and harassing and might have religious uh, information in them, all of which can be uh, triggering and uncomfortable and emotionally harmful. Um, so there are a lot of harms that can come from this kind of outreach uh, and also very little benefit even um, per the organizations themselves. Uh, and a lot of times the, the data that gets scraped is actually sold to nonprofits. So people are kind of profiting off of this uh, scraping of sex workers information. Um, so that's sort of an example of work that we do where we'll um, work with the impacted community to kind of understand, you know, how is this harming you? And then try to convince technologists not to do uh, these kinds of things. Uh, on the positive side, we also partner with organizations um, like ESWA on topics like intimate image abuse, as Eat um, was introducing. So before we get to talking about our, our current work on intimate image abuse, I wanted to touch on a couple of findings from kind of the hundreds of interviews that we've done with sex workers over the years. 
Um, the first is sort of largely echoing um, what Kali and Yid have mentioned. Um, sex workers right, are, are forced to use technologies and platforms that don't take into account their business or privacy needs. Um, and as someone who came out of the, the US originally, I sometimes got pushback that was like, oh, well, the work people are, are doing, you know, isn't legal here. And, and so, you know, maybe it's okay that platforms don't support it. Right, but a lot of the workers that, that we work with, right, and, and this won't be a surprise in the European context, are working legally, are paying taxes, are registered to work where they are, and yet they still can't use digital payment technologies, or they still get kicked off of Airbnb, even if they're using three different phones where one of them is dedicated for Airbnb to try not to get kicked off. And that's really kind of an imposition of one particular kind of framework, um, which certainly I disagree with, but still it's an imposition of one country's framework on other countries and other workers in those countries. Um, and so it's really kind of not the case that, at least as far as I can see, there's a justification for not taking into account people's business needs, let alone uh, safety and privacy needs um, for their work. And so examples of, of issues that we've seen facing workers, as mentioned, are deplatforming from all different kinds of platforms, regardless of the legal status of the work being performed, um, folks being outed or doxxed, uh, being harassed, which can spill into real life, right? So it's not the case that just because something happens online, it never makes it into kind of real world context. It absolutely does. Um, financial harm, particularly from deplatforming from financial platforms, uh, content theft, as we've mentioned, and then also burnout, right? And this is something that has been touched on a little bit in this panel, but of course the pandemic um, made a huge change in how people were doing labor, both for folks who are already um, doing sex work as well as for folks who came into the industry during the pandemic. Um, and while kind of echoing uh, Kali's notes, um, you know, folks were, were safer from distance from police um, and distance from kind of physical interaction, um, we also see that it changed people's digital portfolios. So they were telling us, well, you know, compared to when I was doing, say, only in-person work, I'm finding that I have to be online on more platforms. I have to be sharing kind of more content. People are wanting to have like a richer online persona for me. Um, and I might be having to be like a little bit more explicit or more visible online. Like maybe I used to be able to not show my face, but now there's so much competition in this online only space and a little bit of difference in um, sort of what folks are looking for, that that's a much harder uh, thing to make viable business-wise. So people are kind of finding themselves more online in more places, putting more content, being more explicit, and that raises some of the, the digital concerns that you might have, um, particularly around like content theft, right? Finding your content um, places that you don't want it to be. And so a couple of quotes um, we've had from participants that maybe give a little bit of color uh, to these experiences are in one of our studies, a participant said, you know, I took a selfie in a, a public restroom and I uploaded that to a social media site. And there was a guy that went to the same bathroom and posted a selfie of him in that bathroom directly under mine, like, I know where you are. And so that kind of stalker things are the ones that make me more scared. Uh, another participant said, you know, the platforms or the platforms in general are the, this thin ice that I'm walking on. And at one point it's going to break and everything's just gonna go, you know, to hell. Uh, and I'm gonna fall through. And this is sort of a common um, sentiment among hundreds of people that we've talked to is these platforms are thin ice and they also sometimes are facilitating harms like the first one, right? They're, they're really showing your content to everyone, which in some ways is good and in other ways is not so good because people uh, don't always behave in the way that we wish toward other people. So our goal is to change how technology is built in order to try to improve safety. Um, and we do this through a number of different partnerships, uh, but the one that I'll touch on today 
is the work that Yeet and uh, Luca mentioned, which is a set of research and design projects to try to develop features per for preventing intimate image abuse. Um, so intimate image abuse uh, has probably what I'd say like three different components. Um, and what we are focused on is folks who are consensually producing images, whether for recreation, uh, so like sexters, or for labor, um, like digital sex workers. And so they're consensually creating the image. We're not focused on um, kind of non-consensual where there's like secret recording, et cetera. Um, consensually creating the image they're sharing it somewhere, posting it somewhere, but then it's finding, they're finding that image uh, being spread outside of wherever they initially posted it, right? And I think there's sometimes this misconception that's like, oh, if you've posted your image on OnlyFans, you must be okay with it appearing anywhere else on the internet. And that's not true. Right, both because you consented to have it typically behind a paywall for your subscribers on OnlyFans, or in the case of recreational folks on a particular platform, one on one chat, group chat, whatever it was. And two, in the case of content um, for commercial purposes, it's theft, right? If someone takes your content and posts it somewhere else, you're losing money because they're getting the money from people buying your content or from the clicks or the ads or, or what have you. So you both have the emotional and privacy violation uh, with potential kind of physical harm uh, stemming from that. And you have financial harm because this is theft. Um, and so in this work, what we have done is thus far, we've connect, uh, conducted 57 interviews um, with different groups of folks. So we've done interviews with sex workers and with sexters, and about half of each of our interviews with those groups have been with folks who are uh, victim survivors of intimate image abuse. Um, and then we've also spoken with organizations that support victim survivors. So these are organizations that people might turn to um, after they've had images stolen from them. Um, and the organizations will work with them to uh, help support them in reporting the content, trying to get it taken down, and they may also provide uh, kind of mental health and other support services. And our goal in these interviews is to understand um, very much the technological aspects. So sort of like what technologies are people using to create, store, and share their images? Um, what are their kind of current defense strategies, if they have any, um, for these kinds of attacks? And then what are their dream kind of design features? How would they like the technologies to work in order to better protect their content? Um, and that's something that folks sometimes have really clear ideas about, and other times they have really clear concerns, but not necessarily clear design ideas. Um, and that's sort of where our role as um, researchers is, is to come in and try to figure out how might we prototype things uh, that might work for folks. And then we come back to the community uh, to do what's called participatory design, where we kind of co-design and co-create um, tools that may be useful, and then eventually bring in um, you know, technology platforms or technology designers to really figure out, like, how do we get this into the technology? And so our results uh, in this project are sort of still emerging. We're still actively doing work, um, but I'll share out uh, some of the highlights that we have so far. Uh, the first thing we learned from, from the 57 interviews we've done is that really any technology that you can use to send and store images or videos is being used for intimate content. Um, so this could be anything at all from like Dropbox to local storage on a device to Discord to Kick to very specific um, messaging platforms in a particular country to Reddit, like anything that you can use for image and video capture, storage and sharing um, folks are using. And people are scared about um, you know, their fears around having intimate image abuse happen are around, you know, embarrassment from things coming out, being blackmailed, being outed. This could be outed as a sex worker or outed in terms of your sexuality or your gender. Um, people are afraid of or have been doxxed. Um, and then also, of course, financial loss um, for folks who are uh, selling their images and videos. 
Um, and at a high level, one of the things we see from a technology side is image and video data is really treated with insufficient sensitivity, right? So a lot of times the protections for image and video data are basically the same as text data, but image and video shares a lot more personal information and has a lot more sensitivity, particularly given um, that people aren't kind of using, you know, one of three platforms for, for intimate content, they're using every platform. And so that means that image and video content on every platform is sensitive and the resharing of that content is sensitive. Um, and there, there's this theoretical idea in academia of contextual integrity, um, which is basically that people's kind of privacy concerns are very much focused on who I shared it with, why I shared it, and um, what I, who I expect to be able to receive it outside of who I shared it with. And so this is sort of a, a perfect case study where people are intending to share content, you know, even non-intimate content with a particular audience and then finding it in a completely different audience being used potentially for a different purpose than whatever their intent was originally. Um, and that's very violating. So how are people trying to defend themselves? Um, they are removing identifying features from their images. So this might be face, tattoo, et cetera. Um, they're also doing screening and vetting, right? Kali kind of mentioned screening and vetting um, for in-person work. People are doing the same thing for sharing images. They're also kind of creating like hierarchies of trust based on how well they know someone um, or know a particular a client or a friend or whoever it is or a particular group um, to figure out what they're willing to share kind of at different levels of that trust. Um, one of the things that's come up is how do I handle kind of expiration, right? Sometimes I trust you and then you violate my trust. There's currently no way to really get my content back from you, right? Or to kind of continually be checking in on, on whether I still feel the same way about this um, particular sharing space or interaction as I did, you know, three months ago. Uh, the other thing that, that people are doing is, is they're resigned, right? They're telling us, well, I just assume that my content is public and I just sort of operate with that assumption. And I'd say there's a lot of sort of internalized victim blaming that, that folks um, are sort of exhibiting where they're like, oh, well, I guess it's my fault, you know, if I choose to share content or I choose to, to do this kind of labor. Um, and, that, and that sort of victim blaming is also in, in a way encoded in the technology, right, by this sort of assumption that like, well, we're not going to do anything to sort of protect your content. It's just going to go wherever. And, you know, it's your fault if you shared it instead of putting the, the responsibility on the platform for saying, no, you know, it's your responsibility to make sure my, my content stays where I shared it, which is on your platform and not somewhere else, or in this particular conversation on your platform and not somewhere else. Elisa? Uh, so to that me? end... Oh. Okay, we just have a Sorry, couple minutes more for your presentation, so then we have 15 minutes for the Q&A, okay? Thank you. Perfect. Yes, we're on the last slide. Um, so the dream designs um, that folks had focused around being able to automate metadata removal, right? So folks didn't necessarily want people to be able to look in the metadata for an image uh, or video, which you can do and see kind of the, the location where it was taken, the timestamp, et cetera. Um, people want this both for privacy and also because if you are uh, doing commercial work, you may want uh, clients to think that an image was just taken when you might've done it as part of a photo shoot, you know, a few days ago. Um, people also want flexibility in how they are able to control their data depending on different levels of trust. Um, they would like content tracking as well as detection of content appearing elsewhere and notification about that. So really trying to kind of automate this flow. Um, and they would like safer storage. There really has not been a lot of emphasis on tools or platforms really to support this use case at all, but particularly to support storage. Um, and so I'll close with a quote from, from one of our participants in this work who said, I would like to have full control on what I'm posting on these apps. When the elements for controlling data appear, how uh, on a general page or a private one, uh, to, I would like to protect metadata and, and ensure that my account is safe. I would like, you know, one of those options when people can't right click on our pictures. All of these are, are reasonable and 
relative, many of them are relatively simple technical requests, right? And so, you know, what can we do on this problem? What we can do on this problem is view sex workers and um, everyone who, who creates and shares intimate images as stakeholders, users, and creators who have digital rights, who have privacy needs, who have intellectual property rights, not as, you know, criminals or victims or spam, right? These are stakeholders who are core users of your platform and folks who ought to be uh, supported in their rights as users and content creators. And with that, I'll hand it back to Luca. Thank you so much, Elisa. <clears throat> And uh, Elisa's slides will be available, I think, on the Privacy Camp website. They were really good slides, but we couldn't show them. Uh, so we have a little bit of time for a few. We do? We, uh, 10 minutes? Okay. okay, so we have around 20 minutes for like either questions to the audience and uh, to the speakers or comments, maybe. I don't know if there are more mics, so I give this one. Please raise your hand. Come past the Hi. Yeah, my name is Etienne. I work for Amnesty International. I have one question that I would like to know how much you see the growing uh, religious integrism that is in the US now with your tax against abortion. That's the core of a lot of things because it seems that a lot of things come from the US. And if that changed depending on the platform, especially where the platform is from. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, how much the growing like religious integrism that there is now in the US and we see the attack against abortion how much that is at the core of the first and sister laws, and how much that affect platforms differently based on where they are from. Hello, yeah, okay. Yeah, completely. I mean, obviously, um, a lot of the, the people that were um, anti-sex work also happen to be um, super pro-family and what about the children? So, I mean, yeah, we did um, we did see that as a big impact. And and obviously, whatever is in the States, people think like, oh yeah, it's only, it's only American, it's only gonna affect Americans. But it did have a worldwide impact because uh, I mean, uh, people were allowed to use Backpage all around the world, and actually it was used a lot in Europe as well. So yeah, I would say that, I mean, um, we, we did see that big connection, and um, a lot of those anti-sex work people also happen to be like um, anti-abortion. It kind of seems like all mixed in together, they also happen to be anti-trans. I mean, like I always, I always say that it's really impossible to be sex work exclusionary radical feminists, what they call themselves. Um, they think they're radical feminists. And it's impossible to be like a sex worker exclusionary radical feminist and not be transphobic. So then you're also kind of a trans exclusionary radical feminist or whatever they call themselves. So yeah, swerfs and turfs kind of go hand in hand. And the same thing with like people that are um, anti-abortion also happen to be, you know, I mean, they're, you're against any of uh, like a, a person having um, uh, full um, capacity over their bodies and, and deciding what they can do. So. Obviously, it makes sense that those things are tied, I think. Or, Luca, you want to say something? Yeah, I think there's like a growing amount of evidence about the like, impact of uh, religious groups on like reproductive rights, in particular, you know, uh, right to abortion, etc. And there's less information about like the relation with sex work, but we have like lots of evidence. For example, in the UK, you got an organization called CARE, Christian Action Research and Education, which is like a million pound funded religious organization who's doing direct lobbying to the UK government. And for example, they were uh, supporting bills to criminalize the clients of sex workers, but they're also pushing for like, you know, repeal of like uh, gay rights or trans rights and reproductive rights, etc. As well, like Kelly, Kelly was saying is that it's really shocking for us. Like often we put the blame on like feminist part of the feminist movement when it comes to criminalization of, of sex work in Europe. And we know that feminist organizations have a big impact on, uh, in particular, the Swedish model. Like the Swedish model is the model where clients are criminalized in order to abolish prostitution. But actually we know that these laws wouldn't be passed if they were not supported by a big part of like religious groups and right-wing and left-wing uh, parties. So if you look at Ireland, for example, in Ireland, the main organization that is providing services to sex workers currently is called Ruhama. Ruhama is a religious organization who has the same nuns on the board than the Magdalene Laundries. So we don't have time to go into Magdalene Laundries now. I don't know if you know anything about it. Magdalene Laundries were a religious institution for fallen women during like the beginning of the century until the, like the late 60s, I think. And they were responsible for like lots of traumatic, like I don't know if you, Laurence, you want to speak about it. Like there is really like still a very clear link between religious institutions such as Ruhama in Ireland 
or Mouvement du Nid in France and many others, and uh, other organizations that push for criminalization and then directly benefit from it because then the government makes funding available. And now in France, where we are like so loud about secularism and basically so Islamophobic, so suddenly there's no problem to work with that Catholic organization in order to like uh, criminalize sex work. And I feel like the main one, if you want to look into it in the US, if you look at Exodus Cry, Exodus Cry is unbelievable is this like uh, extreme religious organization who does things such as praying against trafficking where they organize global prayer against trafficking where we also ask for donation and then use this money and exodus cry is one of the actors responsible for the whole campaign against Pornhub and what uh, Kelly was saying about OnlyFans like the whole uh, push to have MasterCard stop uh, working with OnlyFans for example is by exodus cry and other actors like Ashton Kutner whatever his name is Krishna, I don't know this guy. Okay, anyway, that's my rant. Loros? Oh, do we have more people? Sorry. No, go ahead. Please identify yourself. Yeah, uh, I have been identified already. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> you're the processor in this case. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Laurence uh, from DFF. And uh, my question is because, uh, Luca, you mentioned in the, um, at the beginning the, the racist uh, origins of uh, the abolitionist movement as well. Um, how the question of like access to digital rights is also uh, to be differentiated in relation to race, but then also to, to uh, access to uh, legal documents because a lot of the things you said also, Kali, is how people need to identify and give their passport and things like that. And I just wanted to hear more about like how that might also be exclusionary to people who can't do that for uh, obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah, I mean, collection of, uh, you know, ID copies and uh, passport, it's a real problem that uh, we are actually quite against this kind of, uh, this way of age verification. Age verification is important, yes? So we all agree on that, definitely. So we want our workspaces, including online workspaces, to be s as safe as possible. However, there are no different ways to verify age at the moment that platforms use. And, you know, the easiest option to go for is, of course, let's just collect all the data we can. And then, you know, we can then store this data however we want, and then we can use this data however we want. We have no idea how they do that. Um, but it does end up excluding, actually, mostly migrants and, uh, you know, individuals who are in the you know migration process they may have lost their passports you know or they don't have the right work permit for example some platforms even go beyond asking for id copies they ask for work permits like they want to see your work permit especially if you are a person of color so if your photo is you know not white enough they uh, you know have the intent in incentive to ask more uh, questions like this and it is a real problem that excludes migrants from uh, basically generating income, which makes them more vulnerable than to violence. And, you know, uh, then they have to go to pimps, you know, or third parties who, you know, facilitate the sex work for them because they can't do it by themselves. So, yeah. And also, again, like you said, that this um, like differentiated, differentiated access also to the internet. One of the things I, I didn't have enough time because I was <laughs> being pressured um, to say during the, the during the crisis is that um, also it, there was a lot of sex workers that couldn't access the internet. I mean, because maybe they shared or maybe they shared a flat where they had you know a lot of you know other. Um, people they were sharing the flat with, or people that just didn't have access or the funds to to, to have these platforms. But again, like you said, uh, the platforms do require that you be legal, that whatever that fucking means, you know, um, to be able to access a platform. So even if we, even if we were like, for example, in a country like um, like Switzerland or Switzerland and um, Brussels, <laughs> Brussels, Belgium. Oh my God, Brussels is a country. Um, Belgium or New Zealand, where sex work is decriminalized, you still have to be legal to uh, like uh, migration is still criminalized. So you still have to be legal to like 
able to access those platform, platforms of sex workers. So we see decriminalization still has, it's not, I mean, it's not all that glamorous because again, it still leaves out the most marginalized people, which are migrants. So yeah, even in countries um, like, um, like Belgium or New Zealand still have this problem again, you know, like even if you have only fans or many vids, you can't have it unless you have a, um, um, a passport that's uh, in vigor or a work permit. We're having like it in some of the reports, like so mentioning here, we have a couple of reports on uh, privacy and censorship uh, written by ESWA. And I think like there was some specific example of uh, undocumented migrants who want to be able to advertise in a, in a country like the UK, for example. So in the UK, you have a main platform called Adult Work, where tens of thousands of sex workers are uh, advertising. And it's the main way to make an income if you work in the sex industry in the UK, at least like on digital platform. And undocumented migrants need to find a way to advertise there. So what they would do, some of them would find a third party and say like, you know what, I'll do it for you. I'll find a way to hack the system, to use a fake ID, etc. But I'm going to take 30% of your income and I will decide this information on your platform your rates, for example, or when you work, etc. And we are talking with sex workers, we are saying like, we're not able to get out of this because I only wanted to sell sex for a few months and now my advertisement is still there and I'm still receiving uh, fun, etc. from clients, etc. So I think there's a real issue where all these laws, even the laws that are like defined as like trafficking or in Germany, the Prostitute Prostitu uh, Protection Act, all these laws are designed to protect sex workers but are never developed with sex workers and in particular with marginalized, migrant, racialized, LGBTQI sex workers who are more at risk. And often this law that are meant to protect us without talking to us in the first place, actually making us more vulnerable and more at risk of exploitation by third parties in particular. And there's a lot of similarity with like many of the discussion we have around like undocumented migrants in general. If you want undocumented migrants to be safe, just make it easier for migrants to come here. There is no other way for migrants to be safe making it more difficult by you know, creating like more, uh, like less pathways to come to Europe in particular, will make it like more risky for, for migrants. And it's exactly the same for sex workers and platforms. Five minutes, last question. Yeah, last question. Yeah, last question. Yeah. Uh, there's a few more questions. Uh, just one more. Uh, uh, one more. Uh, one more. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ali Sibai from uh, Heinrich Bosch Stiftung. Uh, I just want to ask if, since like during the COVID pandemic, <clears throat> again, since sex workers have adapted or adopted uh, online tools more often, so did this actually facilitate law enforcement crackdown on sex workers through using, tracking them through IP geolocation or uh, like, did this happen, like, to help law enforcement or facilitated for law enforcement to do a crackdown on sex workers as uh, the pretense of sex, anti-sex trafficking and so on? Follow-up question, do you advise, uh, like, sex workers to use, like, VPNs to protect their geolocation and so on? Thank you. So do we, we, if it's the last question, we can take and then we try to respond, sir. Hello, my name is Vitoria. I'm an activist from Brazil, and my question is also to collect maybe perspectives on how we could create financial instruments to not fully in these lives of these persons, but also fully in our movements. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood the question. <laughs> it's a way how we could create financial instruments to make the money flows to these persons, but also fully in our movements, like discriminalized abortion, sexual workers, and so on. Yeah, like creating financial instruments that don't rely on. You want to answer the police? Elisa, did you hear the question as well? OK. Yes. So I give you basically, uh, you can all say a few words, either directly responding to the question or final word that you might have wanted to say and didn't, and then we can close. The financial instruments, I or think. Or the policy, yeah. Yeah, so. I'll just re quickly respond to that. I mean, it's really hard because the terms of services are super anti-sex work. So if there's somebody with a lot of money that wants to create a, an app that's sex worker friendly, or if not, I mean, one of the things that I've been doing uh, as a like survival-based sex work is just finding somebody, a third person, uh, a very good friend who would be able to accept payments for me and use their ID and their like PayPal account or whatever. Although I have got my friend's PayPal account shut down by accident, even though I didn't say anything about sex work. I just said English lessons and still got shut down. So finding third third parties, I mean, isn't the isn't the kind of solution, but that's what I've been doing because I haven't been able to find an app that's actually um, 
that I don't violate the terms of service. So you're always kind of like, you know, um, trying to jump from app to app and not try to keep too much money in any of the apps if you're doing digital sex work. But yeah, I don't know if there's anybody here that has a better, a better solution, but that's what I'm doing for now. Um, I can answer if we are suggesting sex workers to use VPN and stuff like this. So digital security is, of course, an important part of, uh, you know, it's one of the ways, I think, to uh, try to fight back. Uh, and I do personally find them important, but, uh, you know, there are lots of things to consider. So are these tools are accessible enough, for example? Are they cheap enough? Are they, uh, you know, do they have multiple languages? Are they, you know, easy to navigate? So these are all important, uh, and it does leave some sex workers out of these systems, basically. Um, but also, I feel like technology changes really fast, and, you know, uh, you know, technological artifacts are always, you know, uh, reimagined and, you know, people find ways around technologies, you know, to overcome the barriers they basically present. So I don't think it's an absolute solution to just rely on digital security because, you know, these technologies will change. People will find other ways to, you know, interfere with your communications and stuff like this. So I personally think policy is should be really, you know, uh, really, really the fundamental thing to uh, do for us. So we should base all our policies on fundamental, protecting fu fundamental human rights, and then just let the technology evolve around these uh, policies. Thank you. And Elisa, you want to say the last word? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, so I'll address um, the, the technical security tools. So. Um, in a survey of about 100 workers in, in Europe, um, what we saw was that the primary security tool that people were using, not always necessarily for security purposes, but sometimes for that reason, uh, was encrypted chat. So about a third of people were using encrypted uh, chat tools. Only about 15% of people were using um, VPNs and then about 5% we're using cryptocurrency. Um, and I think we have kind of, uh, there's sort of two reasons for that. So one reason that folks are not always using sort of these technical security tools um, is well put by one of our participants who said, I would gladly do all of the above, but that really only works when the customers participate. And they said, you know, Threema, Signal, PGP encryption, cryptocurrency, right? I can no more sort of demand that the Max Planck Society pay me in cryptocurrency uh, than many workers can, can demand that their clients do so. And clients may not want to do so for a variety of reasons. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that cryptocurrencies can't be useful in some way, but at least in the current way that they are built, right? A, you're opting into a different currency system. It has interoperability, payment issues, um, as well as just usability issues. Um, and it has to be cooperative with clients. Um, and then for things like VPNs, while this can be useful um, as a privacy protection, certainly there is this kind of usability trade-off of like using a VPN doesn't change the fact, uh, to Kali's point, that the terms of service are very, um, you know, kind of to the first question of the panel, American-centric and sort of with these particular set of, of moral values um, that prevent people from using them, right? And so I can use a VPN, but that doesn't really change uh, what can I can do with tools. And so I think for a lot of people, the kind of utility uh, cost trade-off of using some of these tools just isn't high enough, and they're not addressing people's like core needs and concerns. Thank you so much, Elisa. And uh, I wanted to say like a few words to conclude. Uh, like many things were said, just on the point of like banking, sex workers uh, have often organized in relation to this crisis for many years. If you look at India, for example, sex workers were not able to access financial institutions. The bank would say, we don't take your money, you're a sex worker. It's probably coming from trafficking. We don't want it. So sex workers created their own bank, which now has tens of thousands of members. And they're able to like save money and do micro credits to support one another. And this is something that sex workers have always done, creating mutual aid support so that we, have, uh, we are protecting each other. I wanted to say a couple of things. We have resources here. We also have these t-shirts. That's why I always wear these t-shirts. If you want to buy one of them, it's, uh, it's helping us. Uh, sex workers and our organization like, work in very 
uh, precarious environment. It's very difficult for us to access spaces, political spaces, but also resources. So we really encourage you, if you are able, to support sex worker rights organization at the local or uh, European level or international level, please do so, uh, you know, reach out to us. And I wanted to finish with one thing that we are working on, we are very excited about, uh, with different partners, including EDRI, uh, and Freedom Collaborative, and hopefully uh, Elisa and the uh, Max Planck Institute as well. I think lots of the things that we said is often that prostitution or sex work debates had been uh, based on this idea that on one hand you got victims of trafficking or other victims, and on the other hand you got sex workers. And somehow it's not possible to get rights for these two communities. But we know this is not true because many of us are victims, whether we are victims of gender-based violence, we are victims of intimate image-based abuse as we discussed, victims of exploitation or trafficking. There is no such thing as like two different communities. Many sex workers are victims, have been victims or will be victims at some point. And what we want to create is more dialogue between different organizations that might not have the same priorities or the same strategies, but should have more conversation about how we create, in particular, digital landscape, digital environment, that both protect the rights of sex workers to sell sex, to advertise, to express themselves, but also protect the rights of victims, including children, including victims of intimate image by abuse and sexual exploitation. So to do this, we are creating this multi-stakeholder dialogue, which will bring together different uh, actors, uh, civil society, policymakers, sex workers, tech, uh, imagining some organization that never come together in the same room to discuss on how we can create this. And as, that's a theme that I've heard uh, throughout the day, is that it is possible to imagine new structure, new design, but also new realities, whether you talk about prison abolition, uh, you know, abolition of border, or new structure that allows sex workers to uh, exist freely without fear of repression. So thank you for your support and have a great day. Bye. <laughs>